Welcome to our final webinar for the 2013 webinar series. Today's topic is on responding to disclosures of sexual assault. As frontline workers and professionals, you are faced with many barriers and it is sometimes challenging to read and respond appropriately. Today, 1800 Respect is glad to welcome your presenter, Judy Flanagan. Judy will provide you with the tools and understanding on how to manage these sensitive disclosures professionally. Judy Flanagan has worked in Victorian Centres Against Sexual Assault for over 22 years and is the current manager of Eastern Centre Against Sexual Assault, ECASA, where she has been for almost nine years. Judy is the current convener of the CASA Forum, the statewide peak for the 15 services across Victoria. The following webinar presentation has been carefully prepared to help guide and prepare you to help your clients. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to participate by posing questions to the presenter at the appropriate times. Please note that the case-specific information cannot be answered during this webinar. All other questions can be typed into the chat box, which is located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. You will notice I have a question pending for you to answer. Responses to your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. After the session, you will be directed to an online survey, which can help us to improve the running of our future webinars for you. We have already incorporated some great ideas from your feedback, so thank you and keep them coming. We also encourage you to participate in the discussion tool, which you will be redirected to after completing the survey. We will be closing this thread at 2.15pm, so jump on if you have any further questions that we may not have time for during the next 45 minutes. There are some useful links on this topic on the 1800 Respect webinar page. We will send you out the link in a follow-up email so that you can share this with those that couldn't attend. I'd now like to pass you over to Judy to begin. Thank you, Michelle, and I would really like to thank 1800 Respect for the opportunity to facilitate this web webinar. It's the first time that I've done anything like this, and I'm really excited to think that professionals anywhere in Australia are able to participate in such a presentation and workshop. I would like to begin by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land, and I believe that I'm on Wurundjeri country at the moment. I thought it would be useful for, for the focus of this webinar to be on what professionals need to know in order to respond when a survivor discloses sexual assault. Our experience tells us that many professionals, like the community in general, do not understand the complexity of the issues surrounding sexual assault and just how difficult it can be for a survivor to disclose. My aim today is to raise both your personal and professional awareness of the issues so that at the very least you will feel able to respond appropriately to a disclosure and if because of your own comfort levels or your professional role you are unable to provide a counselling response then you will know where to refer. So the agenda today covers an overview of the work of CARVAs in Victoria, information about definitions, a discussion about misconceptions, a look at stats, some information about impacts and responses to disclosure. So Centres Against Sexual Assault. For those from other states, there is information about the services on the National Association of Services Against Sexual Violence website, one of the links that I've provided on the 1800 Respect webinar page. In Victoria, there are 16 CASA services funded by the Department of Human Services. CASA provide individual counselling and advocacy and therapeutic group work to children, young people and adults, both female and male, who are survivors or parents, partners and carers. And in 2012-13, we provided services to over 12,000 adults and children. Some CASAs provide family violence counselling and sexually abusive treatment services to children and young people with problem sexual behaviours and sexually abusive behaviours. We provide 24-hour crisis care, which is what our service is to people who have experienced a recent sexual assault up to two weeks following, which in two out of three presentations includes a police response. This is coordinated after hours by our statewide sexual assault crisis line who also operate in South Australia and Tasmania and provides crisis telephone counselling as well. 
In recent years in Victoria, we have been part of a rollout of three multidisciplinary centres, soon to be six, which are essentially one-stop shops where CASAs are co-located and work in collaboration with Victoria Police, Sexual Offences and Child Abuse Investigation Teams, and Child Protection. The multidisciplinary centre model is leading to better outcomes for survivors, particularly in terms of improving access to justice. CASAs are committed to work in primary prevention. There are a few different programs being delivered, primarily in schools, and with a focus on respectful relationships. So all part of our prevention work that we see is very important. We provide professional consult training to other professionals. And so for those of you who, who are in Victoria, you could certainly be recommended to contact your regional CASA to see what workshops they have offered and other resources that might be available. And they'll also provide secondary consultation. And that's because we know that there's Given the stats, there are so many survivors out there that we're not able to provide services to, and so we want to resource others to be able to assist with that work. I just wanted to say a few things about language. I think discussions about language seem to be ongoing, and while CASAs have been using the term survivor to highlight the strength and resilience demonstrated by women, children and men following sexual assault, rather than the term victim or even victim survivor, there have been recent suggestions about using people, people who have experienced sexual assault as a means of avoiding labelling the individual. So I think those discussions keep going. You will also hear the terms sexual assault, sexual abuse, sexual violence used interchangeably. So we probably tend to use sexual assault when the assault is recent and abuse when the assaults are ongoing, as in child sexual abuse or institutional abuse in terms of the clergy in, in the church. And interestingly also, the Australian Bureau of Statistics Personal Safety Survey uses the term sexual abuse when referring to assaults against children before the age of 15. So what is sexual assault? First of all, there's no uniform legal defini definition in Australia. CASAs, through our Peak Body CASA Forum, we define sexual assault as any behaviour of a sexual nature that makes someone feel uncomfortable, frightened, intimidated or threatened. So there's that experiential element to the definition. It is sexual behaviour that someone has not agreed to or to which that person is not capable of giving consent, where another person uses physical or emotional force against them. And of course, we acknowledge very clearly that consent is not a factor when it comes to children who are unable to consent. Sexual assault includes a broad range or a spectrum of behaviours ranging from sexual harassment right through to life-threatening rape. While acknowledging that there are different state laws there are broad offence categories which are similar across Australia under state and territory criminal law. We think that responding to sexual assault requires some legal knowledge. Counselor advocates in Victoria receive legal training through a funded workforce development program and we also have regular liaison meetings with Victoria Police which continues to be an opportunity to update our knowledge about the law. Offences in terms of broad categories include rape, attempted rape, aggravated sexual assault, assault with a weapon, indecent assault, penetration by objects, forced sexual activity that did not end in penetration and attempts to force a person into sexual activity. And then there are general offences such as incest, which um, relate to intrafamilial sexual assault, other sexual offences that are specifically against children, and also sexual offences against people with cognitive impairment, which can include intellectual disability, mental health issues and acquired brain injury. There's also some Commonwealth legislation that I thought might be of interest, and certainly the legislation around child pornography and stalking relate to technology-related offences. And I'm giving you a link to a booklet that was produced last year by South East Casa 
called Social Media and Safety, Sexual Assault and Reporting Options, which you'll be able to have a look at. And even though some of the law is Victorian-based, it will still give you some ideas about how to respond to some of that, I guess, very new area of um, ways in which sexual assaults are perpetrated. There's also a Commonwealth Offence of Grooming, which is probably important to know about as well, because that's about... Um, obviously acknowledging how we know children are groomed by offenders who then go on to, it, to assault them. So there are many contexts in which sexual assaults are perpetrated. I'm going to start at the top with child abuse and witnessing and then basically go around clockwise. So usually assaults in terms of child abuse are perpetrated by immediate or extended family members or else children, sorry, adults in, within social networks, people like neighbours, friends of parents are very commonly perpetrators of child abuse, people who know the child. Sexual harassment in the workplace, educational institutions and other, other institutions those behaviours are unlawful and they may include things like obscene phone calls, inappropriate comments about somebody's body or sex life. Then there's intimate partner violence which obviously relates to young people as well as adults and family and domestic violence which includes sexual assault but is often not initially named by women who are victims, survivors of that. Then there's the information and technology facilitated sexual assault, which I guess I've already touched on, you know, which includes things like the mobile phone, sexting, online chat and dating sites that are used to lure people to meet and then to assault them. Pornography, exposing children to printed and audiovisual materials involving them in the making of child exploitation material. Drug and alcohol facilitated sexual assault. Bit of a mouthful, but that's a term that we use where substances are either self-administered or deliberately used by a perpetrator to make a person more vulnerable to sexual assault. Survivors of, of these crimes often have limited or no memory of such an assault, which obviously creates its own challenges. Sibling sexual assault, whilst a form of intrafamilial child abuse, it, it's my suggestion that sibling sexual assaults have often been minimised in the past. So that's why I put it there separately. Trafficking of women and forced prostitution. Female genital cutting, which we include as a form of child abuse, given that it is illegal in Australia and grounds for mandatory reporting. Elder abuse. We know that older people are abused either by their children or carers in both homes and residential settings and institutional abuse, so abuse by the clergy in the church and usually men in positions of, of authority in other institutions, so the, really the focus of the current Royal Commission in Australia. So I guess it's important just to have a sense of just how many ways people can be sexually assaulted. I really like this quote, which su suggests that rape is about violence, not sex. If a person hits you with a spade, you wouldn't call it gardening. It is a reminder that sexual assault is more about power and control than about sex. It reinforces the notion that sexual activity is the weapon used in a violent act. So myths and misconceptions about sexual assault. There are many inaccurate and harmful assumptions and beliefs in our community which serve to disguise the existence, incidents and true nature of sexual assault. I'm going to run my first poll. So here are some common statements about survivors and which statement is true. Well, that was just too simple, wasn't it? <laughs> Quite clearly. So yes, you're absolutely right that survivors of sexual assault are predominantly female. And in fact, um, one of the stats that I have to corroborate that is a, an ABS 2006 statistic that suggests that women are three and a half times more likely to be sexually assaulted than men. 
men over their lifetimes. I'm going to look at the other two statements on our next slide. And so, at the, from just looking at the bottom of the slide, survivors invite sexual assault. That comment, <clears throat> the reality of course is that no one asks to be sexually assaulted, but we know that these attitudes and beliefs are still out there in our community. There was a 2009 Vic Health Community Attitudes Towards Violence Against Women survey that suggested that 13% of people still agree that women often say no when they mean yes, and that 16% of people agree a woman is partly responsible if she is raped when drunk or drug affected. The survivors consent because they don't say no. Silence clearly does not imply consent, and we know that a freeze response is very common. Being paralysed with, with fear does not mean that a survivor wanted the sexual assault to happen. So you were very correct in um, rejecting both those statements. I just wanted to add a couple of other very common misconceptions. So the next one is most adult perpetrators of sexual assault have been child victims of sexual assault. There has been some a study done in 2009-10 by Ogloff and Kutajar, Child Sexual Abuse and Subsequent Offending and Victimisation, a 45-year follow-up study, which is the largest prospective study to demonstrate with confidence that the majority of victims sexually abused during childhood do not perpetuate the cycle of violence by becoming an offender. And we certainly still hear that common misbelief. The other thing to say about that is that it should be noted that the majority of survivors of sexual assault are female and that we know perpetrating by adult women is uncommon. The next statement, most sexual assaults are reported to police and in fact the reality is that it is the opposite. Most sexual offences are never reported to police. Certainly our experience at CASAS corroborates this and an ABS statistic that supports this from 2006 is that four out of five women did not report to police in the most recent incident of sexual assault in the last 12 months. Overwhelmingly, the majority of clients that we see in Centres Against Sexual Assault choose never to report to police. The final statement at the top, again another very disturbing commonly held belief that rape results from men being un unable to control their need for sex. That same Big Health Community Attitude Survey suggests that 34% actually still believe this. So I think you know we still have a lot of work to do and we need your assistance to continue to challenge and change these commonly held beliefs in our community. Misconceptions can be very harmful as they blame the victim for not preventing the violence. They blame the victim because she supposedly caused the violence and they blame victims for being harmed by it. Misconceptions excuse the perpetrator or render him invisible. They minimise and trivialise the impacts of violence and we're going to talk a little bit later about some of those. They disregard free agreement to participate in sexual activity as a fund fundamental right, free agreement, consent. They deny or cloud coercion and fear as weapons in sexual assault and they conceal victim survivors' resistance to sexual assault and capacity to survive. I'm going to play a short clip from the Arkansas Coalition which, while it's American, illustrates very well many of the common responses survivors receive. It's called You Said What to a Sexual Assault Survivor. Start the clip now. The following absurd statements are real responses endured by sexual violence victims provided to us by rape crisis programs throughout the state. Not to blame the victim, but we do kind of dress like a slut on a daily basis. Well, you know she was asking for it. Look at what she was wearing. I told you he was no good, and now look what happened. This is what happens when you don't listen to me. You were flirting with him all last night. It's not very nice to lead someone on. He did what? Well, he paid for it, right? Prostitutes can't be raped. Well, he could have killed you, so you're kind of lucky, right? Well, what were you wearing? 
Everything happens for a reason. So how many times can she accuse somebody of this? It's not the first time. What's she doing wrong? Really? Rape? Don't you think you're being just a little dramatic? If you go to the police, it'll ruin our family. Please. You can't rape the willing. I'm sure you didn't mean to. If it really happened, why did you wait so long to tell someone? Did you hear she got raped? You know that if you go over there at that time, it's a booty call. Mm, that's true. At least it wasn't your first time. He can't really rape you if he's your husband. Maybe if you had fought harder, it wouldn't have happened. But he's such a nice guy. Are you sure that's what happened? You know there's a difference between rape and regret, right? At a loss for words? Try using the following statements when speaking with the victim of sexual violence. I believe you. It's not your fault. Nothing you can say will change the way that I feel about you. You did nothing wrong. Do you think you want to contact the police? I believe you. It's not your fault. He made the decision to rape you. Just because you said I do doesn't give him the right to do that to you. Even if some people don't believe you, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. I'm here if you want to talk about it. I believe you. It's not your fault. Thank you for trusting me with this. So, as you'll see, I think they deliver a fairly powerful message and it sounds like the responses in America are very similar to what we hear in Australia, so it seems to be like a universal response, which I guess is why I chose the clip. Misconceptions can be harmful, as we've talked about, and there are many consequences. These ideas impact on our community in many ways. They encourage survivors to blame themselves for the violence and its impacts. It's silence. They silence survivors because they doubt that they'll be listened to or believed. They prevent survivors seeking support, such as counselling, accessing medical care and or legal redress. They prevent actual accurate levels of sexual violence from being known because, of course, so much sexual violence has been hidden. They protect perpetrators from taking moral and legal responsibility for their actions and they perpetuate rather than prevent sexual assault. Having an understanding of how prevalent sexual assault is and who are the survivors is important to being open to a disclosure. The first statistic from Ferguson and Mullen in 1999, whilst it's um, I guess an old stat, it's the study was a meta-analysis, a study of studies, and so it's probably the only study to date of its type. And Ferguson and Mullen have estimated that one in three women and one in six men are victims of child sexual assault. So that's a stat, stat that you'll commonly hear. The second statistic relates to the ABS Personal Safety Survey from 2005 and talks about 12% of women and 4.5% of men experiencing sexual violence before the age of 15. So I guess it's the ABS personal safety survey statistics that are our most um, up-to-date Australian data. You probably know that the 2012 survey has been completed and in fact the results were released just last week. So where there are comparable statistics, I have included the most recent ones. So the third stat, the one in five women and the one in 20 men having experienced sexual violence since the age of 15, whilst it's the most current stat, it's also consistent with the 2005 personal safety survey. 98% of offenders are male. And I always like to say, whilst the majority of offenders are male, the majority of males are not offenders, because I think that can be you know, a quite uncomfortable stat for many men. We know that the majority of sexual assaults occur in private dwellings, again, part of the problem and the hidden nature of the problem. Women are more likely to be sexually assaulted by someone they know than by a stranger, and the same with men, and again, the most recent ABS stat. I thought I'd include some statistics about Indigenous women who are 35 times more likely to be hospitalised due to family violence, of which sexual assault is a part, and 90% of Aboriginal women in prison have been sexually abused at some point in their lives. The third one, the risk of sexual violence in adulthood doubles 
for women who experience child, childhood abuse. So we see adult women who have been re-victimised re who are made more vulnerable because of their childhood history. Some stats about young people. Girls aged between 10 and 14 were the greatest proportion of survivors, followed by young women between 15 and 24, and at least twice as many boys under age 14 were victims of sexual assault than any other males. And older women continue to be, experience sexual assault. So our second poll. So in this case, I'm asking you which statement is the most appropriate response? It sounds like it was a terrifying situation for you to be in. Are you sure you remember what happened accurately? And C, it makes me so angry when I hear people describe those experiences. So which statement is the most appropriate response? Okay, so again, I haven't really been able to trick you at all, have I? So clearly the first statement is the most helpful in that it's a clear statement showing that you believe the person by saying that you're acknowledging that it was a terrifying situation for them to be in. When you're asking, are you sure you remember what happened accurately, you're actually suggesting that you're not believing what you've been told. So that would be considered an unhelpful response. And just as it makes me angry when I hear people describe these experiences, you know, a strong emotional response to either a child or an adult will basically just shut the person down. Okay, so we're just going to talk a little bit about impacts of sexual assault. It's important to say that there is no one way a real victim should look or act. And again, because of the sorts of stereotypes that are out there in the community, this can be a real problem. Survivors may experience none, some or many of the possible impacts of sexual assault at different times. There are a range of factors that can influence the impact of sexual assault. So things like the relationship to the perpetrator. If it's someone known, it's more likely to have a significant impact. The extent and severity of any accompanying psychological or physical abuse. The severity of the abuse. The length of time over which the abuse occurred. The responses of family and friends to disclosures and the experiences of various systems, for example, health, police and courts. So there are many psychological, emotional, physical, social, interpersonal and financial impacts and I have listed some of them there. I'm not necessarily going to talk about them but I just want to mention that in terms of cases of recent assault it's clearly important to consider things like access to medical care and there may be injuries, there may be um, a risk of pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections and there may also be many post-traumatic stress disorders and we know that mental health issues are incredibly pre prevalent amongst survivors of sexual assault. There are a number of barriers to disclosures. So firstly, the measures the offender has taken to maintain secrecy. Particularly where the offender is a family member or carer, disclosure is known to be delayed. There may be threats or coercion. There may be bribes or promises. When we come to think about young children in particular, they commonly don't have the language to be able to tell someone what's happening to them and also they may not even know that what is happening to them is wrong. So there are lots of barriers. The fear of not being believed or being blamed, they are the two most significant barriers to telling. Survivors fear being accused of false allegations, gossip among peers and threats to personal safety. There may be fear of legal consequences of disclosure in terms of what might happen for the offender, for example, a father going to jail. Feelings of responsibility, guilt and shame work against disclosure and particularly where a survivor may have experienced sexual arousal. Expectations and attitudes about what is normal, particularly for young people, where stereotypes about how young men and women should behave in relationships can make it difficult to identify sexual activity as sexual assault. Concerns for others, whether they be people or even pets. Being male is a barrier because we know that there's increased risk of stigmatisation for admitting to being a victim and also fears about being labelled homosexual. 
and there are a number of other cultural and fa factual va factors and values that work against disclosure. So in terms of responding to disclosure, it's important to believe your client. I know that sounds simple, but it's really very basic. And to validate and normalise the impacts of sexual assault. Most people think they're going crazy when in fact they're experiencing very normal responses to an abnormal event. Don't blame, avoid the why questions. Why were you out late at night, for example? Ensuring safety. So if we're talking about children, it may be that you need to be reporting to child protection, mandatory reporting. You might be needing to find safe accommodation for an adult woman. Emotional and physical safety are really important. Being not judgmental, both verbally and non-verbally, and survivors are very quick to pick up when you are not being genuine. And encouraging and assisting to re-establishing a sense of control, so providing options and choices so that the survivor feels that they're in charge of what's occurring. So there are just some very basic principles to guide any intervention with adults and children. Essentially that sexual assault is unacceptable, that all people have the right to be safe from sexual assault, that it is a criminal act. A person should always be taken seriously if they allege sexual assault or abuse that all people have, who have been sexually assaulted have rights to be in a safe and supportive environment and to have access to legal intervention, counselling and treatment. And with children, intervention should aim to promote the relationship between them, them and the non-abusing parent. Okay, so our final poll, which statement most applies to you right now? A, I feel confident about my ability to respond appropriately to a disclosure of sexual assault. Okay, secondly, I feel somewhat confident about my ability to respond, but I know how and where to refer clients to specialist sexual assault services. Okay, that's good. And the third one was I do not feel confident about my ability to respond. And really those, those answers are, are perfect because I think with this work, it is so important to know how comfortable you feel with these issues and at the very least, if you can respond appropriately to a disclosure and then refer on to an appropriate service, then you've done a really good job. Okay, so that's the end of our, our poll. And um, I would very much like to thank you for attending. And now we'll be opening up for questions. Thank you, Judy, for that great presentation. Uh, the video we just watched on You Said What to a Survivor really highlighted the complexity of how an unprofessional response could negatively affect a survivor. So um, now we're just going to open up for a few questions for Judy to answer. So if you would like to ask a question, please do so by typing the questions into the chat box at the bottom left of your screen. Um, we have had a few questions come through uh, for you, Judy. Now the first question comes from Sam. Sam would like to know, is it uncommon common for a survivor of a recent sexual assault to call for an ambulance? Um, I would say that it is uncommon because probably in, in our experience in Victoria, the overwhelming majority of survivors of recent assault won't have other physical injuries that require emergency medical care. In, the reality is that probably a fairly small percentage of recent sexual assault survivors require emergency medical care. And so in Victoria, our crisis care units, um, most of which are located adjacent to emergency departments, have that capacity to provide um, that care when it is needed, but in the overwhelming majority of cases, it, it isn't. So. Okay, that's great. So just another reminder to all of the participants online, please do type your questions that you may have for Judy into the chat box so that she can answer them uh, before we log off for today. So please type them into that chat box down the bottom left-hand side of the screen if you do have any questions for Judy. I think this is often a topic that you know many professionals aren't necessarily comfortable with and um, I guess that's the aim of having a webinar on the topic and um, you know it is really good to get your feedback and to get you to think about your own comfort levels for working with survivors of sexual assault. Um, I think survivors are very well tuned to knowing whether 
people are comfortable with the content or not and they'll very quickly shut down if they sense that you're not comfortable. So I suppose um, if you do get a, a disclosure and you're not particularly comfortable with hearing it, being able to link that person in with a service or somebody who is is, is really critical. Okay, so this is our final reminder for all of you participants online. Uh, if you do have any questions for Judy, please do type them into the chat box there. I can see a couple of people typing there. I guess. Okay, we have had one more come through from Megan. Okay. Yep. Uh, so why are sexual assaults so infrequently reported? Look, I think there are many barriers to reporting sexual assault and probably um, one of the most critical is the fact that more often than not the victim survivor will know their offender. So if it is someone known, like a family member, somebody in your social circle, um, you know, a parent, basically somebody known, an employer, there's lots of barriers to actually speaking out about sexual assault, let alone reporting it to police. And um, I mean, I think also there are lots of uh, accurate and inaccurate ideas about the legal system and how it deals with se sexual assault survivors. And um, there's no doubt that, you know, the legal process can be quite arduous and um, I think that's one of the one of the barriers but I guess in Victoria with the um, the services I mentioned before where we're um, co-locating with police and um, child protection I guess that's an attempt to make that process easier for survivors to report and to feel very supported through the whole process um, I guess as counsellor advocates in Victoria, um, you know, we obviously talk to recent victims about their rights and about reporting, but it's, it's very much our job to support whatever it is that the survivor decides that they want. And I guess for many, you know, apart from knowing the offender, it may be that, you know, the timing's not particularly good, they're concerned about people knowing. Um, you know, I guess there are just so many barriers to people deciding to report um, at the time, let alone um, beyond. And, um, you know, whilst I think, you know, in Victoria in particular, we've had um, some really, you know, good efforts to try and increase reporting, which, which it has somewhat, um, with our sexual offences and child abuse um, investigation teams. You know, there are still many barriers. I think it's a, very much an individual decision and um, it can be a hard call to make. Great. And we have had one more question come through from Brad. Uh, Brad would like to know, what are we learning about male sexual assault and differences needed in the approach of it all? Okay. Well, look, I think, um, you know, whilst there are some particular issues that relate to males that are different to being victimised as a female, um, certainly centres against sexual assault in Victoria have, you know, really driven to make themselves very male friendly um, and some have male counsellors for either female or male victim survivors who choose to see um, a counsellor of either gender and look I think it's about really just um, being clear about what the issues are for males you know that there are some particular barriers for males but we also know from our experience majority of males probably still choose to see a female counsellor because in the main they've been assaulted by males and that's I think you know a typical sort of barrier for for many people to access um, a male counsellor um, and I, I guess the other thing is about having groups for males because you know males do often respond differently um, in terms of their um, responses to sexual assault. For, so, for example, they may be more likely to act out and get themselves into trouble with the law or involved in sort of criminal activity, you know, through violence, for example. And um, 
you know, so I think we do need to be very understanding of that. But I think increasingly over time in Victoria, we've seen more and more males accessing cars and, um, you know, and I'm not sure about what happens in the other states, but, but you know, obviously as that occurs, we learn more about the male experience, but it's, it's not necessarily so different in its impacts um, as it is for female victims, so... That's Hopefully great. That Thanks. You. Thanks, Judy. Um, now, we have just had another comment come through from uh, Kessie. Now, Kessie's mentioned that um, I think she may be talking about when you were speaking about the barriers and unsure of what the consequences for the person who disclosed abuse, which actually takes me through to another question. Um, are there any consequences for those who do report abuse? Um, you mean consequences for the person reporting? Yes. Um, I'm not quite sure what the person's meaning by that question, really. I mean, I guess, you know, when you report abuse, presumably, to the police, um, you are considering undergoing a legal process. And so certainly if you're reporting to police in Victoria, you'd be, you'd be going to our um, sockets, our sexual offences and child abuse investigation teams who are specifically trained police to deal with sexual assaults and child abuse. And um, if it was a recent sexual assault, um, within 72 hours, you'd be brought to what we call our crisis care units across Victoria, where you can access, where recent victims can access a medical examination um, and also ha have the support of a counsellor advocate through that process and then be linked in for follow-up counselling. So, I mean, really, it's very much an individual decision about whether or not one reports to police. And I think, you know, there just have been many barriers to reporting to police that have been acknowledged. Okay. And Marlene has also put a comment through or a question through saying, what about transference from therapists? As in assuming that the therapist is um, an offender? Is that what, you, is that what she's suggesting? Um, I'm, I'm Marlene, really are sure. you able to clarify that just typing into the chat box? I mean, if that's what she's if that's what she's suggesting, I, I suspect that most female victims, for example, are much more comfortable with a female counsellor, as are many male victims, um, than they are with a, a male counsellor for that reason that they feel safer with a female counsellor. So, Marlene has just popped a comment through there saying, "No, not as an offender, but a prior victim." Oh, okay. So the counsellor being a prior victim. Look, I think, you know, it, it probably depends on the extent to which um, sexual assault support services are professionalised, but certainly in Victoria, um, all our counsellor advocates, as we call our staff, um, are either psychologists or social workers, and usually they come with, you know, some level of counselling experience because we know this work is very difficult. Um, and it needs, you know, a lot of support through supervision and, you know, appropriate training. We have a workforce development project that ensures that all our counsellor advocates across the state have access to targeted and um, specialist training in an ongoing way. So I think, you know, maybe in other states, I'm not sure how professionalised the workforce is, um, but, you know, in general... Um, it, I guess it's um, a much more professionalised um, workforce in Victoria, so I, don't, I can't, really can't comment about other states. Okay, that's great. Now, it does look like we are just about out of time, so thank you, Judy, for answering all of those questions, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Now, we do hope that you feel more confident in responding to disclosures presented to you by your at-risk clients. Uh, please stay logged in to take our short online survey, and at the end of the survey, you'll be pr provided with a link to our discussion forum where you can discuss any comments. Please note that case-specific information cannot be posted on the online discussion, and Judy cannot answer any case-specific questions. We thank you in advance for your feedback. Every comment you make is taken into serious consideration. 
please visit our website next year for the 2014 webinar series. We have some equally compelling presenters to provide some very valuable information. It's going to be an exciting year. Lastly, you can find all of the webinar presentations online on the 1800 Respect site and you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel. On behalf of the entire 1800 Respect team, I thank you for your support and attendance this year and we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy and Safe New Year. Take care over the festive season. Thank you and until next time.